Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Josh. You're a lot like my own church. You're a bit rowdy in the morning and hard to settle down. And that's okay. Uh, my name is Josh, as Brian said earlier. My wife and my three boys are here today as well, and it's great to be here. It's been a few years since I've we've been down. I think everyone uses the excuse of COVID, but I think it's legitimate when it comes to visiting other churches and having a, a young family as well has kept us um, from you guys. But we've been here a few times. We're, we've been friends with Brian and his family and John and Rachel and all for I don't know how long now. I think you guys came down to me when I was in UL when I was a lot younger than now. I'm still I'm still relatively young, but it was a while ago now, that was probably like 2009, I'd say, when I first kind of got in contact with you guys, and our church is kind of, feels like a bit like a sister church, you guys have the same kind of vibe, and uh, we've known each other and had those connections for so long, so thanks for the invite, um, a lot of you are asking, why am I here, you know, and I ask myself the same thing, but uh, <laughs> um, working all week and, and the boys and everything trying to study, you're just like, and then you sit up, stand up here and you're looking at us like, wait, what did I study again? Where are we? What's happening? But uh, John asked me to, to, um, to fill in, or more accurately, he asked Pastor Tim to fill in, and Tim asked me to do it. He said, I don't really want to go down. <laughs> He's like, I'm really busy, so he handed it off to me, which is fine. I was like, oh, we'll go down, we'll have fun. So it's really cool to be here. Um, and that's, that's the truth, and I'm, I was only joking. Um, and really cool to be here for, for the baptism today. It's very exciting. I was trying to think when the last time we had a baptism at church, and I think it was the summer before last, so we had to get a few people, you know, uh, discipled, and, uh, and in those ways, it's such a cool thing to, to, um, to be baptized and to show to everyone else, you know, this is what's happened to me, and this is how I'm going to live. So hopefully today's... Uh, message will be applicable to that. And before we do that, just to settle my own heart, I'm just going to pray. Uh, so Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for Sundays. We thank you, Lord, remembering why we meet as believers on a Sunday, that you were raised from the dead, Lord. You died for our sins, Lord, but more importantly, Lord, you were raised, and we know that there's new life, as Romans 6 teaches us, Lord. That's when we were once dead in our sins, but we've been raised with you, Lord. We were buried with you, but we've been raised with you, Lord. We, we love those things. We love your teaching, Lord. We stand on that. And we thank you for this fellowship here. We, we pray for, for John as he teaches later on um, over in California there, that he'd be just um, filled with your spirit, Lord, that people would just glean from your word and really just have a better grasp of you, Lord. The same for us this morning, Lord, that we would... Hear something different, Lord, that our hearts would be open, Lord, that our ears would be attentive, Lord, to what your Holy Spirit's telling us, what your word is teaching us, and what you'd have us to do, Lord. We don't want to be a people, Lord, who just hear your word and go off and don't do anything about it, but Lord, we want to be the person who listens, Lord, who follows, who obeys. So, Lord, we ask for this this morning that your word would be clear that what I say would be clear and that, would, that your people would be encouraged, Lord. For some here that needs correction, Lord, that you'd correct them. For those people who need encouragement, Lord, who are down or, or whatever it may be, Lord, that you give them the encouragement that they need. Whatever we need, Lord, this morning, we'd ask you to give it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're going to be in the book of Proverbs. And why are we in the book of Proverbs? because I've been teaching Proverbs <laughs> back home. And uh, to be honest, it's been really on my heart as well. I was thinking, will I go somewhere else? I think the last time I was here, I taught on Peter and uh, him, his denial of Christ and him coming back into the fold. And I think the, the one before that was, when I was down here, was on Kings, 1 Kings 19, and Elijah being scared off into a cave and needing encouragement. And I kind of go here, there, and everywhere when I'm invited to teach places, but I think just for ease and for my own sanity, I, I chose this because I've taught on it recently, but it's been really on my mind recently, the Proverbs. And mainly because uh, me and Pastor Tim were talking about it back home there in Banlaslow, you know, and a lot of you can relate to this. When you kind of look out in the world and you're going through your week and on all those things, and you're just living life, 
and you look at the way the world is, you're like, man, and especially me as a, a, a dad of three young boys, I'm like, how are they going to manage like in the next generation? What's the world like? What you look around and it's, and I think it's nearly exacerbated by the fact that we all just look at a screen all day and scroll and see all the chaos and everything, and it doesn't help. And um, when you look at the Proverbs, it's just, what is it? It's a book of wisdom, right? It's these short sentences and it's expressing what God is, what his heart is and what's, what's the smart thing to do. How, what way to go and what way not to go. The Proverbs are brilliant. If you haven't studied it before, I'd really encourage you to get into it. But this morning I'm just going to be teaching on mainly the wisdom of God and that phrase that pops up, and it's so key, it's the main underlying theme of Proverbs, which is that phrase, the fear of the Lord, and what that means. So this morning we're going to be looking at, as I say, what the wisdom of God is, what true wisdom is, and what the fear of the Lord is that, and how can we walk in that? What are the applications to that? So like I said, Proverbs is a comparison between the way to go and the way not to go. They're, they're, they're mostly sayings. We have many sayings, and we use them all the time. You can either call them proverbs or little sayings, like, um, don't throw the baby out with the uh, bathwater. Everyone knows it, right? And they're good sayings, and, and they make sense. And uh, what does that mean? You know, you guys should know what that means. Don't just get rid of everything. There could be something good in there, you know? We've got hundreds of them. I, I, there's, there's good ones in... In just normal society and they're really good and they're we can use them in our lives and all they might not be from scripture but they're brilliant I heard a really really good one by Mark Twain recently and it's always do right this will gratify some and astonish the rest and it's brilliant like when the well is dry we know the worth we, we will then know the worth of water isn't that true proverbs are brilliant but but the but the Proverbs, what, he, what he's teaching there, it's, it's obviously Solomon who wrote this, who's considered this, the wisest man in the Bible, and one who didn't actually follow his own teaching a lot of time. But, he, but what's the purpose of this book? He's trying to instill wisdom. He's trying to teach his kids. This is the way to go. This is how you're going to become wise. You know, you look, you look out in the world, and there's, there's, there's people, and they're the smartest you can imagine. They've got intellects off the charts. They're PhDs, they've got every letter before their name, they've got tenure, they're earning thousands and thousands a year and they're in universities and all, but do they have wisdom? And I was just thinking as I was kind of going through a lot of the preparation for this, especially a few weeks ago, and it's this thought that if they don't have true wisdom, their life won't look that different from any other foolish person, right? Do, do the people with with great intellect and maybe who have, they might be the, you know, they might have the best knowledge on whatever it may be, science or computers or whatever it may be, but does their life look that different than the rest? Is the divorce rate amongst those people less than the rest? Is alcoholism less? Is drug use any different? Is this, that and the other? If you don't have the wisdom of God, even as a Christian or not a Christian, if you don't have that wisdom, and what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing truth. That's all it is. And applying it. That's all it is. It's knowing what truth is. And thank God, we know what real truth is. We know the person where truth comes from. Mm -hmm. But you can have this professor, him or her, and they're the most smart person, and yet their life can be a shambles because they don't follow God's principles. God's principles keeps us in line. They make us look more like Him. They give us order. This is brilliant for the, the, the people getting baptized today. To base your life, these foundations, as you go through your marriage, as you go through life, that I can stand on these things. And, I can, and if I read the Proverbs, if I know what Solomon's saying here, if I can learn maybe a thing or two, and if I base my life on this book, on what God tells me, on what He's revealing to me, if I get that understanding, then I'll look like Christ. And my life, even though loads of things may be happening and trials and tribulations and so on, it won't be falling apart because 
I'll have that. I'll have the fear of the Lord. I'll know who's directing me. I know where I'm supposed to be. This is the overriding aspect of the book. To find wisdom. In verse 1 of chapter 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To understand words and insight, of insight. To receive instruction in wise dealing. In righteousness, justice and equity. Produce prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. He's trying to lay out here what the beginning of knowledge, who should get it, why to get it. So you'd have justice, so you'd have righteousness, so you'd have equity, so it produced prudence. It says, let the wise hear and increase in learning. The, the foolish person says, oh, I've learned all I can know. I hope you're not like that. I've caught myself a few times as I've maybe listened to a Bible study before. And I've heard some instruction from someone. Oh, I know this. That's a bad attitude. That is a bad, you, you know, that's a bad uh, attitude and heart to have. I've arrived. I don't need to hear that. No, the wise person will increase in learning always. That's why the, the wisest people you find may not be the oldest person that you find, but hopefully if you find that older person who you see like, man, they've got real godly wisdom, they're different. It's usually those people are the, the humblest, right? And they, they're okay to be corrected. I get, I get this instruction sometimes. There's a few people I know, um, my profession, I'm, I'm a carpenter, I work with, I just started a job with the HSC there in, in the University Hospital in Galway. But I've come across tradespeople all the time. Some really good at their work, some not so good, but most of the time people are pretty skilled. But the, there's one guy I know and he's like, he, he's, as, he's just really proud. I, I know it's like, oh, you know, it's easy to point out pride in someone that's hard, maybe harder for them to see it themselves or even our own selves, our own pride. But they're, they're just like, oh, I'm doing it this way. And you try to say, I think this is better, to be honest. Like, and you're looking at it from a different angle. And they're like, no, you know what I mean? Like, it's always my way, my way the highway. And they, they could be five days down that road, and they're still like too stubborn to change. And there's someone else, um, a contractor I know, and, and he's, he's retiring age, but real gentleman. Doesn't know the Lord. I've worked with him for about four years now. But a real gentleman. And he has loads of knowledge. Like, he know, he's been in the job for... 40 years and real intellect, real reader, and not just in construction, but he's got a real, real brain, real, real uh, high IQ, I'd say. But, but loads of times he asked me, Josh, I was thinking about doing this way, you know, when he's showing me a job, but do you have any other way? Do you know what I mean? Do you have any ideas? And I sometimes I'd say, no, that seems good. But sometimes I'd say, I think this would be better. He'd go, yeah, you're right, do it that way. Isn't that real humility like? That's, that's wisdom, right? Even He's got loads and loads and loads of experience, and here comes this guy who's been in the trade for maybe five or ten years, and he's like, yeah, your way's better. Go do that. You know, that's, that's true wisdom. It's good to have a, a mind and a heart that says, yeah, I'll increase in learning. I, I haven't understood what, all that I, I could. That's so true for us in a spiritual way, too. We haven't arrived. No one's perfect yet. So, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's that phrase again, like I said, the underlying theme of the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord. What does, what does the fear of the Lord? A lot of time when we hear fear, we think of like dread, don't we? We think of being afraid. The fear of the Lord is more of a reverence for, for God as, as who He is and who we are. It's knowing that He is great, He knows everything and we don't. The fear of the Lord is just acknowledging His place before, before us. We talk about all the time letting Jesus become our what? Our Lord and Savior. What's Lord? Lord is our Master, right? When He says something, I'll do it. So the fear of the Lord is just really obedience to God. You know that his ways are right and that yours aren't. You see his thoughts as higher than your thoughts and better. You see him as more intelligent than you. 
That is the fear of the Lord. When I hear the fear of the Lord, I always think, I, I like to think, I think Brian does as well, think in stories and maybe pictures. And that's kind of just how my brain works. But a lot of times when I hear the fear of the Lord, I always think of that, that Old Testament story of Potter, or, um, Joseph, right? And Potiphar's wife. And sh if you don't know the story, it's back in Genesis. You can look at it later. I'm not going to go through it in detail now. But this woman seduces Joseph and she's trying to, to basically just trip him up, right? And this man fears God and Potiphar is his boss. And he, he's trying to get out of the situation. Remember, he leaves his coat behind him and he runs. He just gets out of that house. He's like, I'm having none of this. This is not right. And he, right, he fears God. He fears maybe the, not only the implications of what could happen. He could be killed. Potiphar could catch them out and, and kill him or whatever may happen. But he feared God, right? But what, what I want to really bring across in that story, you can look at it yourself, like I said, is the phrase that he said. He didn't say, I'm going to sin against you. He didn't say, I'm going to sin against Potiphar. He said, I couldn't do it because I would sin against the Lord. It wasn't against anyone else. It was about his conscience. A great teacher um, and someone who had a big influence on me as a teenager said, you are who you are in the, in the pitch dark of your room. And that's, that's the truth, your thoughts and what you're like then. What you're like in front of people right now, of course you're going to be pleasant now, right? Of course you're going to be good. The fear of the Lord is what drives you to think right, to, 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 put the, to let the word go over you, to be changed. It's the fear of God. It's, it's, the, it's the knowledge that God knows my every thought. Read Psalm 139. It's a brilliant, it's, it's my favorite psalm. That he, his thoughts for you are more than the sands of the shore. I think one cube, one cubic foot of sand has billions. I think something like, if I remember correctly, something like at 10 billion grains of sand in one cubic feet. Did you I, I didn't count, though. No. <laughs> but can you imagine how many billion pieces of sand are in the world? What about La Hinge Beach? How many billion pieces of sand are there? And God, it says that God's thoughts for us are more than that. And if you think about someone that much, and these two here are thinking about it. I remember, I'm 10 years married now, and I remember, and not that I don't think about wife now, but I have a lot more to think about. <laughs> and I love my wife, and it's, it's different, but right now you're, you're engrossed, right? It's, it's infectious, it's brilliant. When you guys kind of came up here and you just said that you got engaged, my mind was brought back to about 10 years ago, and I was like, oh man, it's brilliant, you know? But your thoughts, are the, they're in the thousands right now. But no matter how much you think of each other right now, it'll never, ever, ever fill that one cubic foot. And God's thoughts of us are as the whole earth full of sand, you know? And if God thinks about us like that, do you think he cares for us? Do you think he wants our time? Do you think he wants our heart? Does he want us to follow him? Does he, does he love us? Yes, he does. All those things are yes. And if he's thinking about that, it should encourage us. Man, I need to live right. Like I said, you are who you are in the pitch dark of your room. Those thoughts you have, all that. And you, you may think now, oh man, I'm, I'm wicked. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and so am I. But it's about actually acknowledging all that and changing and letting God's word, letting his Holy Spirit come over you and change those things. The fear of the Lord, that drives us to be like Joseph and drop the cloak and run, get out of there. Just like, say for me, I've been self-employed for four years now and I'm going to change my job soon, but if I want to maybe fudge the line with my taxes or whatever, or whatever I'm doing, or, or I'll put in for more hours there, or I'll kind of, I could get away with a bit more money charging there, I could, you know, no, like, uh, no one's going to know, but, but there's one person who will know, and that's the fear of the Lord, and that's the beginning of what? Of knowledge. In other words, their wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom, of, of wisdom. Knowing who God is and knowing who we are and how we should operate. Mm -hmm. That's what should be our drive as a, as a Christian, our moral drive. Knowing who he is. Wanting to be like him. And all that's, it's not driven by law and it's not driven by obligation and God being our taskmaster. It's driven by love. It's like I said a minute ago, his thoughts for us, what are they? They're, in, they're infinite. And he loves us. And it, it should be driven by a relationship. <coughs> I 
I don't, you know, treat my wife right and try to do the right thing by her because it says it by law, or you know, or because the Bible, you know, just because the Bible says it. No, because I love her, you know, and what and the Bible clearly teaches that, you know, that if you know what's good for yourself, I'm paraphrasing this. It's Ephesians four and five. If you're good to your wife, you're basically being good to yourself because she's going to be good back, you know. <laughs> and it's the same, the same in our relationship with the Lord. He first loved us, therefore we love him back. The, the driving force there, of course, is love. I heard a great analogy recently. He's talking about we're all, of course, on a path. The scripture talks about being the narrow way, the narrow path, of course. But he says there's two, there's two ditches either side of our path as we walk along with the Lord. There's one of complete... Um, maybe abandonment to the law. It's all about grace, guys. Just forgive and keep going. And, oh, but you're being too, you know, no, we can just keep doing that. And it's like, we'll continue in sin, you know. That's fine, like, the Lord forgives. But then the other side of that is another ditch. And that's complete legalism. No, you have to do it this way. No, you slipped up there, no way. So, so I think that the Proverbs, in a way, is just keeping you on that little straight and narrow, right? That you're not falling off into this doctrine of legalism, you're not falling off of just complete, um, what's the word, there's a word for it, where you just don't care about law, lawlessness, License? yeah, just kind of lawlessness, it's kind of, the, Paul deals with the, with the Corinthian church, doesn't it, come back here to the center, where you have grace, but you have, you have obedience as well, there's a great book, I'm going to plug it now because it popped in my head, but Jerry Bridges has a great book on the discipline of grace. And it's talking about the grace of God and how to operate in God's forgiveness and His love, but also operate in we have our part to play in it. And we don't earn our salvation by it. But we still need to do our part. It says in verse 8, Hear my son your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland for your head and pendant for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. See, there you go. Our children, as we raise them, you know, there's going to be so many things to entice them. Come with us. Do this. The same with us now. But we, like I said a few minutes ago, we need to be like Joseph there. And no, no, I'm going to drop my cloak. I'm going to get out of there. And this is, of course, Solomon instructing his children about the right way to live. So we've learned this one. What have we learned so far? We've learned that true wisdom is from God. It's truth that God reveals to us. And if you're truly wise, I said it a few minutes ago, it doesn't matter what age you are, you can have a 60-year-old Christian who's barely matured since the first day they knew the Lord. Does anyone, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands, I'm not going to ask you to point at anyone here. <laughs> but you, there's, there's, I, I know a few and I'm not going to name them in my own life, but there's people that are in their 50s and 60s and, and maybe even later, and they've, been, they've known the Lord for ages, but you wouldn't know it because they're not growing and the, the wisdom, it's not, they're not changing. And you may know it, I know several, my brother-in-law, he's like 20, 21, and like, He's wise beyond his ears, as the, the, the saying goes. But, the, but it's because God's had a grip on them. They're like Christ because they've been around them, right? So wisdom doesn't have an age requirement. You, you don't just automatically get wisdom because you're older. But you, ideally, you want to be getting more like Christ with every week, right? With every day, with every year. That's a prayer we had this, this January of my family was next week let's be more like christ than we are today and i think that's a really good attitude isn't it yes. to, to, today this afternoon to, now i want to be more like christ than i was yesterday and how how is that possible well let's listen to what solomon says seriously go home start reading the proverbs every day it's brilliant there's 31 of them right and how many days are there a month on average usually 30 or 31. not in february not in february oh no the wrong month <laughs> It's the wrong month to get baptized, baptized too, out in the Atlantic there, but sure. It's okay. I told Brian yesterday, you can get baptized in fire, or you can get baptized in ice, or whatever's going to be out there today. Oh, man. 
No, it'll be fun. You'll be okay. <laughs> Well, the Proverbs are brilliant. I love the way they deal with, um, they just deal with like every sort of matter. Finance, they deal with people's moral decisions. They deal with actually four, four types of people. If you want to, I don't know if anyone's taking notes, but there's four types of people that the Proverbs deal with. And it's brilliant. Like, it deals first with, with the scorner. It's someone like, the actual Hebrew phrase is someone making a mouth. Someone scorning. And like I said a few minutes ago, a lot of those people who are really wise in their own eyes, with all those letters before their names, they kind of scorn and scoff at Christianity, at Christ, at people. You believe what? You believe that God was actually in the flesh. You believe in God full stop. But you believe that God became a man and lived a perfect life and died, rose again. And because of that, you have like entitlement to heaven. And you go, yeah, amen. That you just that's perfect. That's that's the creeds of the gospel. Like that is what we believe. But they scorn at that type of thing. The Proverbs deal with that deals with that person. The Proverbs deal with the second person, that's the fool. They're in self indulgent and, and and lazy. And that's the foolish person. The Sam the Psalmist writes, The fool in his heart says there is no God. The Proverbs deals with the fool as well. A lot of the time he uses the analogy of a sluggard. Like in the autumn, they don't bother harvesting at all and they, and they won't get anything to harvest because they weren't diligent back in the spring and the summer. They're lazy, they're foolish. The other person that deals with is the simple. Another word for that is naive. Does anyone remember their teenage years? Well, do you remember how, what your attitude towards life was? You knew everything. That's naive. <laughs> I remember what I was like as a teenager. I remember what it was like maybe five years ago, and I didn't know anything. And I don't know that much now, but what I do know more than back then. But you can't be taught. You're naive. And the last person that the Proverbs deal with is the, deals with is the wise person. So this morning, do you want to be... Do you want to be listed in which category? The scorner, the fool, the simple, or the wise? Hopefully you want to be considered as the, as the wise. And how do you get that? You fear the Lord. That's the beginning of knowledge. That's the beginning of wisdom. It says there in verse 7 in the second part, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Just like that person I was telling you, that carpenter who's been in the trade for so long, they'll despise instruction because they think their way is the best way. We have that attitude sometimes. I know, I know you do if you're like me. And that needs to go. I'm going to go for the five minutes because I said I'd finish early because uh, we have that baptism to do. But if you will, you can turn with me to Romans 3. This is more of a, this is a gloomy part of the sermon, for sure. It'll be alright. We'll end on another good note after it. Romans 3. Starting at verse 10. I'm sorry if this morning's sermon wasn't as coherent as maybe I thought it, would, it could be, but my brain's been a bit all over the place this morning. We've been talking this morning about the fear of the Lord, the wisdom of God, and now we're going to look at what man is like without God. What, and you can replace your name here if you want, and it makes more sense if you do sometimes. But it says, as, as it is written in Romans 3 verse 10, Josh is... Um, Josh is not righteous. There's no one righteous, right? You can put your name in there. No one understands. No one seeks for God. This is what our heart is like without the, without the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Without Him changing our heart, without changing our mind, that's what it's like. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. Jeez, Josh, why are you teaching on this? I don't know, but anyways. <laughs> and the way of peace 
they have not known. Now this is the key verse. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Isn't that the world? There's no one, they're not righteous. What's righteous? Is that perfect? No, that's right standing with God. There's no one who understands. You have all these people and they're so smart and they can do anything. But they, under, they don't understand the real truth. They don't understand, which is the hardest thing to understand maybe, is how to deal with their sin. How they could be changed. You can ask someone who's really skeptical about the gospel, skeptical about God, ask them the question, is the world as it, as, is it as it should be, do you think? And they'll all tell you no. Because there's a sin nature in man. And they don't know how to deal with that. None of them seek God. They've all turned aside. It says, is it the book of Judges says, they did what was right in what? In their own eyes. The verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They do what they think is right. We know that by our own politicians. What laws they pass, they don't fear God. They don't fear what he thinks. They don't think he's real. But us as Christians, how are we going to be, how are we going to be different? We're going to have a healthy fear of God. Knowing who he is. Knowing how he thinks of us. Knowing what, and more, most importantly, what he's actually done for us. It says in 1 Corinthians, He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Wouldn't that first floor you? He became sin. The gospel is powerful, isn't it? That Christ himself became sin for us. That he, he accepted the very wrath of God for you and me. And what does he give us? Righteousness. Right standing with God. If you, if you believe that in your heart this morning, God sees you as perfect, as if you'd never sinned. Therefore, should you just continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. May, hopefully, this morning that we'd have a new view of God, that we'd have more of a fear. Not, oh, I might fall off this tightrope and God's going to punish me. No, a new love for God, understanding that He loves us more than we ever thought. And therefore we know, yes, my response is to obey. If His Holy Spirit says, don't go in there, listen. Turn that off the TV. Listen. Like Joseph did, drop the coat and run. God calls us to a holy life, one that reflects Him. And where does that come from? A fear of God, a healthy fear of Him. And if you, if you grow cold in your walk, if you let your heart harden what happens you won't be that righteous will you of course you're going to be saved of your sins you're going to be right before god but you're not going to be looking like him you're not going to be seeking after god you're going to be turned aside you're going to become worthless as a christian you're not going to do good you're going to be like romans 3 verses 10 to 17. that's what you will reflect so uh, my encouragement to you this morning, my encouragement to the couple here getting baptized is have a fear of God. It's good. If you go through, and if, if anyone wants them after, I can, actually I'll read them out now, you can write them down if anyone has taken notes. Some good Proverbs that tells you what the fear of the Lord does for us. In Proverbs 3, verse 7 and 8, I'm not going to read it, but it, the main idea is there's something that physically happens. It says it, it like cures our body. <coughs> There's lots of doctors out there that say anxiety and people who think on things all the time and who, who live in that way, it like pr produces an unhealthy body. It's not the mind actually will produce an unhealthy body. If you have a right standing with God, a right fear with God, you'll have peace. It's good for your, even your soul and your body. In Proverbs 14, 26, we see what the fear of the Lord does there. It gives us boldness to follow him in the right way. Proverbs 19.23 says that, that the fear of the Lord gives us life. And said, Christ said that too. I'll give you life and life more what? Abundantly. Abundantly. Life. To obey God is good. To do the right things before Him is good. <coughs> and, and in Proverbs it says you should seek after things as if they're gold and silver. Have you ever seen those weird shows where people go into the rivers? They might be in California or something. They go trying to get a bit of gold. Do you ever see those? 
And the old style, they'll have this big basin. I don't know exactly how they do it, but they might, they're, they're shaking it around like this and there's, it's all swirling and they're getting different layers off. And eventually they get down to these tiny little bits of gold if they do it right. They have these different machines now they put it into, but it takes patience. It, like really, like you can't just do it too much or you have to do the exact right technique or else you'll lose it all. And they do it bit by bit by bit and they get rid of all the dirt and the mud and the slush and everything. At the very end, they have a few specks of gold or maybe they have a little chunk if they're very, very fortunate. They'll have that little bit. And it took so much effort and diligence. And what does, the, what does Solomon say? Seek after wisdom as if it's silver or gold. Be diligent about it. Be patient with it. Continue at it. Don't just get frustrated and throw it all out. That's, that should be our attitude. That should be our attitude towards God's word, that we're reading it, we're letting it go over us. We're letting it renew our mind and letting it, uh, letting it make us in his image. Because that's what the word of God does. It's, it's supernatural, isn't it? And sometimes you, you just know, like your, your day is different if you, if, you, if you began it the right way. If you began it in God's word and in his spirit, it's a totally different day than if you didn't. It's supernatural. A pastor once described it like this, like, Sometimes you don't even know how it worked. You don't. It just, something goes in there. You, don't, you may not know really what you read or understood it perfectly, but you know you met with God. You know he's doing something. You know that you're living and you're stepping out in the right way and you're, you're putting the right foot forward, if you know what I mean. But he's, he said it's kind of like when you have a glass of orange juice or you, you, have, you, you eat the right diet. You don't just get a buzz like you're taking a drug and go, oh yeah, and it makes you real relaxed, right? Oh, I can, I can feed, I can... I can picture this pastor doing it right now. I can feel the vitamin C, dude. He's like a real hippie from California. Oh, the vitamin C hit, you know. No, you don't feel those things. It's not an instant hit, but it's good for you. It'll keep you healthy. All those things you ate, but you don't feel it straight away. You don't feel a buzz from it, maybe, but it's, it's good for you, and it's keeping you healthy. And that's the same with God's Word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hopefully that's the verse that could keep sticking in your head this morning. And the, the last place I'm going to finish is in Deuteronomy 13. Strange place to finish, but I think it's a really, just a good benediction for us this morning, a good encouragement. Maybe a verse that you'll underline, that you'll learn, and that you'll be encouraged with this morning. Deuteronomy 13, verse 4. This is a warning against idolatry, and this is the encouragement to us what we should do as opposed to, to follow our idolatry. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. I love that. Last phrase there, hold fast to him. It's not, not a bunch of laws and things to be following. It's a person to follow. He's asking us to have a personal relationship with us. He asks, he's asking us to listen to him, to obey him. He's asking us to serve him. Is there something to do here? Is there something you could be doing right now that the Lord's been asking you for a while? Well, do it, because he's asking you to do it. And does he know best? We have a million excuses. It says obey his voice there. It says keep his commandments. Isn't that brilliant? It, in the very beginning of verse 4 there, you shall walk, it doesn't say with the Lord, after the Lord your God. It's like, it's a real, it's, a, it's putting an onus on us to, to do something. To get, you know, walk after him. Pursue him. So that's my prayer for you this morning. I'm going to pray now. So uh, we thank you, Lord, for these, these words, Lord, uh, these words of wisdom in Proverbs. We thank you for these words even by Moses, Lord, penned uh, just thousands of years ago. It's still so applicable to us, Lord. The truth is still the truth, Lord. Lord, help us fear you. Have that healthy reverence for you, the Almighty God who knows us, who loves us, Lord, who thinks about us continuously, Lord. 
Help us appreciate that more. Help us just obey you, Lord, to keep your commandments, to obey your voice, to serve you, and Lord, most of all, to hold fast to you. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.